This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. Indigenous and environmental activists have opposed the Line 3 oil pipeline in Minnesota for years. As it nears completion, protests along the route have grown more intense. Why are we continuing to attack water protectors with violence and brutality? Why are we continuing to build new projects that we know are creating an unstable climate for our future. The company building the pipeline says it's not a new project, but a replacement and necessary for oil transport. We're building back better. This is safer, this is cleaner, this is better. But how much does one pipeline affect fossil fuel use and climate disruption? Pipelines are relatively easy to focus on, but it certainly is not a inefficient or a cost-effective way to reduce emissions. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. I'm Greg Dalton. It's no surprise that pipelines have become flashpoints in the debate over America's energy transition. The world's energy transition is the focus of the UN Climate Summit, known as COP26, set for early November. Between now and then, we'll bring you regular reports on the run-up to the conference in Glasgow. Hurricane Ida and other extreme weather events underscore what's at stake. Climate One correspondent Aman Azar explains. The Conference of the Parties, or COP, is a yearly event attended by the countries that have signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, a treaty agreed to in 1994. Last year's meeting was cancelled because of the pandemic. This year will be the 26th COP summit, hence COP26, hosted by the United Kingdom. The conference is taking place at a time when countries across the world are experiencing raging wildfires, unprecedented heat waves and catastrophic floods. So how can COP26 demonstrate the urgency of climate action more than it has in the past? Firstly, it needs to demonstrate that the gap in emissions reductions is closing rapidly and the action is accelerating so that we are moving in the right direction to stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit of the Paris Agreement. That's Kaveh Kilanpur, Vice President of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, a climate policy think tank. He says, secondly, COP26 needs to deliver on the promise of $100 billion in climate finance by 2020. Thirdly, COP26 needs to deliver on how the world is going to adapt to the inevitable impacts of climate change. But how will the summit deliver on these promises? Countries are expected to come up with enhanced ambition towards dealing with the climate crisis in terms of reducing their emissions and also to come forward with, with more climate finance. In addition to committing serious money to the climate crisis, each country's nationally determined contributions or emissions target are critical. But as Gillenpoor says, They are only targets. What will really matter is whether the major players will follow through on their promises. The major economies have have significant influence, so the G20 countries will be very important. The fact that the US is back on the climate agenda and engaging under the new administration of President Biden. Um, China will be very critical because of its emissions and its, uh, its economic Um, strength and importance around the world and of course the European Union. I think India will be a crucial player. Brazil traditionally is very active. The least developed countries and the alliance of small island states and these are the countries that are most impacted by the effects of, of climate change and they are very vocal and have a lot of influence. Adrian Salazar, policy director of the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, argues that the business-as-usual approach to the fast-unfolding climate crisis will not work anymore. There historically has been a troubling intermingling of fossil fuel industry at the UN Climate Summit. There is a lot of concern that fossil fuel companies lobby and influence the international agreements coming out of the climate negotiations. And we cannot allow continued pollution through some of these false solutions that fossil fuel companies advance, like market mechanism loopholes and carbon offsets. It is time to get emissions down to zero, period. That means the COP26 is not just expected to demonstrate real climate actions, but also bridge the public mistrust about market forces such as oil and gas companies and their outsized influences on political systems. So there's a big laundry list for the world leaders to sift through when they meet in Glasgow in November. 
and the world will be watching. For Climate One in Washington, D.C., this is Aman Azhar. Canadian company Enbridge is building an oil pipeline from the Alberta tar sands through Minnesota to the Wisconsin border. The new pipeline, which is nearly complete, is a replacement for the existing Line 3, built in the 1960s. That pipeline has a history of leaks, and Enbridge says the new pipeline will be safer and allow them to transport more oil, including heavier crude. The company plans to start moving oil through the new Line 3 in October. Indigenous and environmental activists say the new route for Line 3 opens up more of Minnesota to risk of water contamination and locks in burning more fossil fuels for decades. They've been protesting the construction with civil disobedience, leading to hundreds of arrests and serious clashes with police along the pipeline route. My guests today represent different sides of this debate. Mike Fernandez is Senior Vice President of Public Affairs, Communications and Sustainability at Enbridge. Kelly Sheehan Martin is Senior Director of Energy Campaigns for the Sierra Club. And Daniel Ramey is a fellow at Resources for the Future, a think tank in Washington, D.C. We're not going to get off fossil fuels overnight, but Kelly Sheehan Martin says we shouldn't be building more pipelines. The science is telling us that we have to stop building fossil fuel infrastructure, new fossil fuel infrastructure today, if we want to avert the worst impacts of the climate crisis. Our window to act on climate is closing, and Line 3 poses an unacceptable threat, not only to our climate, but to land and clean water and tribal sovereignty. Mike Fernandez, oil pipelines were built across the U.S. and Canada with little national attention and opposition. Why do you think oil pipelines have become such a point of contention in the past decade or so since Keystone XL became a national symbol? Well, one, I think uh, climate change is real. Um, and as a consequence, uh, people are focusing on anything and everything. The misengagement around Line 3 is that Line 3 is a replacement pipeline. If you don't approve of the replacement, there are the permits in place to continue with the old pipeline. The old pipeline has has flaws and challenges, which is why in conversations with the Obama administration, we decided that what we needed to do is replace that pipeline throughout much of North America, rather than endure the costs as well as the risks. And the other thing to keep in mind here is that pipelines are but one way that we transport fuel. And the other options burn fuel in order to move it. So if you're doing it by train, you're doing it by truck, you're doing it by ship, the reality is right now there is the demand for what already flows through the current Line 3. The Line 3 replacement project will do this now more safely and with more concern for the environment as well as uh, tribal cultural resources. Well, why not do the replacement in the existing place of the existing pipeline rather than a, ah. a new place, which is, you know, you're, the indigenous people are being really impacted by, by this? Well, so the, the first part of your question is right. The second part of the question is inaccurate. Um, the reality is, is, is what took place is we did what you'd expect us to do is as we went through the replacement project, one, lots of environmental impact assessments. In fact, over 13,000 pages of assessment, more than 70 different public hearings, which Sierra Club and others participated in, including those parties that have sought to uh, get this tied up in court. Um, and the reality is all those groups have been heard all along the way. In hearing from those groups, the bulk of the modifications, nearly all of the modifications, were made in order to make sure that everything was more conducive to safety and to environmental protection. And in fact, I can point to very specific ones where we made changes because of requests coming from tribal communities. Kelly Sheehan Martin, don't you think that a, a new pipeline is better than an old leaky one? 
I think that if the old Line 3 can't be operated safely, then Enbridge should hire Minnesota workers to decommission it. It's not an excuse for there to be a huge new pipeline that would carry climate polluting tar sands for decades to come at a time when we can least afford it. And look, Line 3 has been the subject of so much controversy and so many years of review and legal challenges because people are rightfully concerned about the threat, about the major threat of this pipeline, of a new pipeline carrying hundreds of thousands of barrels per day of some of the dirtiest oil on, on the planet through their waterways and through their um, homelands. Daniel Ramey, the tar sands oil is dirty, but it looks like this line is going to go into commission soon. It's going into, going into operation soon. Uh, do these battles affect gas prices? How does the market look at something? We're talking about one piece of metal here in a big system. It's a great question. And any individual pipeline will have fairly modest effects on global and national gasoline prices in the United States. However, the local effects, both environmentally and economically, of pipelines can be really significant. So, uh, for example, if there is a spill uh, from any given pipeline, that's going to have a major consequence at a location. Spills are uncommon. They're unlikely, but when they do happen, they can be devastating. Similarly, a unplanned shutdown of a pipeline can have major economic effects at either end of that pipeline, particularly on the receiving end where refining typically takes place. And so moving away from fossil fuels absolutely is an imperative to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, but doing so in a way that is planned uh, and in a way that allows the workers and communities to um, make new plans for their livelihoods uh, would be a less disruptive way to move towards a low emissions future. Well, Daniel, let's stay with you. What What is achieved if a pipeline project is is stopped? Does it keep the oil in the ground or does it just, is it like a balloon, you squeeze it and it squirts out somewhere else? It's somewhere in the middle of those two things. So the effect of shutting down any one supply route from an oil field, let's say, is to raise the price of exporting that oil in some other way. So if the pipeline were to shut down, the oil could be moved via rail, it could be moved via truck, it could be moved via barge, but those are more expensive ways to transport the oil. As a result, prices would go up a little bit and production would go down a little bit. It wouldn't prevent all of that air from leaking out of the balloon, let's say, but a small percentage of it would uh, would be affected. So let's say you reduce um, oil flowing through a pipeline by 100 units. That won't reduce consumption of oil around the world by 100 units, it might reduce it by uh, 5 units or 10 units or something like that. And so calculating the exact effect of shutting down any single piece of infrastructure is actually really hard because it's hard to know how much of that air is going to stay in the balloon. Kelly Sheehan Martin, one activist said to me, you know, the basic uh, strategy here for environmentalists is to raise the cost of business to, you know, to incur pain upon, you know, the supply companies. Uh, we saw that may had some effect with Shell drilling in the Arctic. They sunk seven billion dollars in the Arctic, and there were protests, and Shell walked away from the Arctic at least for the time being. Is that the strategy here? Is to kind of drive up the costs of these projects? I think that if clean energy was operating on a level playing field with the oil companies and the fossil fuel companies, then we would see a lot different outcome and a swifter transition happening toward clean energy. You know, the industry enjoys um, billions of dollars worth of subsidies from the U.S. government every year. And that means that uh, we are promoting too frequently a business as usual approach. And I think the, the, I would say that the people that are on the front lines right now that are most impacted by this pipeline and similarly that are most impacted by climate change are out there because they are fighting for their livelihoods and they're fighting for their survival. And I think that to say that the whole point is just to drive up the cost of business is really disingenuous. Well, let's hear from one other. We want to uh, should say that we invited both uh, Winona LaDuke and Tara Hauska to join this conversation, and they were unable to. So, well, let's hear a clip from activist and indigenous attorney Tara Hauska. We have treaty rights that were guaranteed for this place. They're in violation of that. 
they're in direct violation of their own laws and we are not trespassing we are this is our land this is our territory Enbridge is trespassing just like all the other companies and so many other places where sovereign nations have said no Mike Fernandez, let's get your response to that about the, the treaty rights and the, and the sovereignty of land where this pipeline line three is going through. So actually what Tara just said is inaccurate in the sense that every time we build or rebuild a pipeline, um, we are required when um, native lands are involved to go through a process that includes the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We did that with line three and we did more. We did a complete um, cultural assets audit that was conducted by natives throughout every mile of the track throughout Minnesota. And none of this is impacting even historical lands that are in dispute between uh, Native American communities and the federal government. It does, though, Mike. There seems to be this history with you know Dakota Access Pipeline, which maybe wasn't your company. It's true, certainly in British Columbia. That uh, and there's a well documented history in the United States of uh, industrial sources being placed in communities of color. There is you know systemic environmental racism at play where these some of these uh, dirty sources of pollution are placed in communities that don't have a lot of power. Well, I, I think I think operators need to act responsibly, and, and, and that's what we've done. I mean, even in the context of Minnesota, which was kind of the lead-in to this conversation, is that you know we've coexisted in Minnesota with the most sacred and productive uh, lands and wild rice waters for over seven decades, and we have thoughtful partnerships. Uh, the stretch of land that is actually used for the pipeline only intersects or abuts uh, two native lands. Those tribes that are on those native lands uh, approve of the pipeline replacement. Uh, we have over 700 workers that are working on the pipeline that are from the indigenous community. So there's no thought here to trying to look past uh, what are either the rights or what are the interests of any minority group nor any tribal community. Let's go to Daniel Ramey. So I think there are two things that we need to try to hold in our heads at the same time. And these two things are hard to hold in our heads at the same time. The first is that there is a reality of environmental racism and discrimination in the United States. Our current infrastructure contributes to that. That includes pipelines. It particularly includes oil refineries, which disproportionately impact black and brown people around the United States. And at the same time, there are some tribes in the United States, certainly not all, but some who are supportive of increased oil and gas development and would be supportive of the economic benefits that come with it. And so we need to try to understand that there's complexity here and that some tribes are going to be very opposed to this pipeline for a variety of legitimate reasons, and others might be very supportive of it for reasons that from their perspective are legitimate as well. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about the fight over pipelines. Coming up, we discuss the environmental justice and tribal sovereignty perspectives on pipelines. Indigenous people, people of color, black people in this country have been met with centuries, centuries of genocide and violence. That's in fact what our country is in part built on. And I think that this is no exception. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. We're talking about why pipelines are such a flashpoint with Mike Fernandez of Enbridge, Kelly Sheehan Martin of the Sierra Club, and Daniel Ramey with Resources for the Future. As part of the Line 3 permitting process, Enbridge set up a fund called the Public Safety Escrow Trust in May of 2020. These funds have been used to reimburse costs associated with maintaining the peace uh, around the pipeline. What this means in effect is Enbridge is paying the cops who are tear gassing and shooting protesters with rubber bullets. Let's wait, 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 wait. <laughs> uh, so, I, I mean, the reality is not that we set up a fund. We were required to provide dollars to a fund that is managed 
by a state regulatory body. We do not control the inflow or outflow of money other than to meet the request that's put forward. Let's listen to uh, another clip of Indigenous attorney Tara Hauska, this time speaking on Democracy Now! The uh, level of brutality that was unleashed on us was very extreme. People were shot in their faces, in their bodies, in their upper torsos. I saw a young woman's head get split open right in front of me. Um, it was a really, really brutal scene. And the arrests in, in person were also quite brutal, throwing people face down in the dirt and being extremely violent in a situation in which we were outnumbered by police at least two to one. And many, many, many counties present protecting this one place in which also happens to be a county where a murderer, an actual murderer is still on the loose, has not been caught. But there were somehow over 50 police officers in that one place watching water protectors. Kelly Sheehan Martin. Indigenous people, people of color, black people in this country have been met with centuries, centuries of genocide and violence. That's in fact what our country is in part built on. And I think that this is no exception. Why are we continuing to attack water protectors with violence and brutality? Why are we continuing to build these projects, new projects that we know are damaging our water and our air, and we know they are creating an unstable climate for our future. And I just can't see why this is what we need to be doing or want to be doing when we have ways to meet our energy needs without it. And I will offer that in preparing for this, I saw the essay that you wrote, Mike, and that talked about poetry and fiction, Don't Tell the Whole Story was the title of it. And it undermined the writing of Louise Erdrich, who talked about the breathtaking betrayal of Indigenous communities in Minnesota with the construction of this. I think the time for this kind of undermining of Indigenous voices, and especially of Indigenous women, is over. The time for that is far past. And it's time where businesses and forward-thinking companies are investing in clean energy. They're investing in the transition to clean energy. They're not locking us in to decades more of fossil fuel infrastructure that is going to really end life as we know it. And instead, they're investing in clean energy solutions and the transition that puts people to work building the kind of world that gives us clean water and clean air and a stable climate and that protects our um, integrity and protects our diversity of people and life on this planet. Mike Fernandez, let's get your response to that. Yeah, so uh, Enbridge has invested billions of dollars in terms of the energy transition with offshore wind, uh, with solar, They're greening our own operations in terms of how we actually operate these pipelines such that we're again using solar and wind. And in addition, uh, through our utility, uh, we have the largest facility in North America using renewable natural gas. Um, we are blending uh, hydrogen in with our natural gas. Uh, we have carbon capture projects that we're building in various locations. Uh, so we get it. We understand. We're intent about building a bridge to the energy future. The challenge is how do we get beyond the political hyperbole that gets placed and misplaced in stories like line three, where when we've dealt with law enforcement, it's all a bit, bit about, you know, we don't endorse violence. We want to de-escalate. Uh, we want to honor people's uh, and respect people with their right to protest. But peaceful protest is one thing when people bring ladders and billy clubs and tear up equipment and destroy property and trespass, literally climbing fences and 
spitting at workers who are also indigenous people. That goes beyond the kin. Mike uh, Fernandez, around the United States, 36 laws have been enacted that address protests aimed at fossil fuel projects, according to the U.S. protest law tracker. Critics say these laws impinge on the right of assembly and disobedience. Arkansas, for example, passed a law that would punish an individual blocking a sidewalk with up to one year in jail. Uh, does Enbridge support these laws? No, that, that, those things are ridiculous. Does seem odd that we, you know, in our society, as people can physically attack U.S. Capitol Police and maybe get a month in jail, but you get a year for blocking a sidewalk. But, the, but Mike, I also want to come back to you that with, you know, the you say that we we need this infrastructure. The Energy Energy Information Agency, the world's authority on energy, recently said we don't need any new investment in fossil fuel infrastructure if we're going to meet the Paris climate goals. The Minnesota Department of Commerce opposes Line Three on the grounds of a questionable future future demand for oil. That's the business and energy establishment talking. What does that mean for Enbridge? What's the transition path if it's saying we don't need more uh, energy and fossil fuel energy infrastructure? Yeah. So again, line three is a replacement. It's not new. Um, so that's a little bit different. And so if you are looking at where the demand for energy already exists and there's no easy replacement, what you don't want to do is say, OK, we're going to shut down this line. Why? Because now we're going to go ahead and we're going to move it by truck, by train or by ship and literally burn fuel to move fuel. And we've looked at this pipeline. Uh, we've made it better in the ideal. What we're doing is what the Biden administration laid out all the way back in their campaign. We're building back better. This is safer. This is cleaner. This is better. Daniel Ramey, let's get you in on this. So the recent report that you referenced uh, from the International Energy Agency uh, is focused on achieving net zero emissions by about 2050. And what the report says is that there is no need for new investment in new oil and gas producing fields. There is, however, some room for additional investment in some fossil fuel infrastructure. That said, it's a very low level of investment that would be needed, and we are clearly not on track to get where we need to be to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius or even 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And I think what we're seeing here is that there is a deep frustration among many, particularly those in the environmental advocacy community, that we are not on track to hit these targets, and that the federal government uh, in the United States, as well as most governments around the world, are far off track from doing what we we need to do to have a healthy environment uh, in the decades and centuries to come. And so when you have that frustration, I think there is an understandable desire to focus on pulling any lever that is available. And in many cases, uh, pipelines are relatively easy to focus on. They're relatively easy to tell very compelling and important and real stories about the people who are affected by those pipelines. But it certainly is not a, an efficient or a cost-effective way to reduce emissions. Right. I've talked to environmentalists who say this pipeline by pipeline is a game of whack-a-mole. You stop this one, but another one comes up over here. It's, it, but they are good um, organizing or mobilizing t political tools. Uh, Kelly Sheehan, Martin, your, your response to that. You know, a lot of environmentalists attack supply. It's easy to villainize uh, or organize and villainize companies, but it's much harder to tackle demand, which involves donors and members of environmental groups. So what's happening on the demand side? See, this, isn't that more effective place to fo a focus? Well, they're both effective places to focus because the climate crisis is here on our doorstep and we need all hands on deck. And so absolutely, the on the demand side, we are um, retiring nearly half of the, more than half of the coal fleet in this country has been retired um, in the recent decade. We have clean energy coming online to meet our electric needs on, at a rapid pace and in a way that leapfrogs the need for for gas, fracked gas plants. We have investments happening in clean transportation that reduces the demand for oil, absolutely. And I think we're seeing major progress on all of those fronts. And on the supply side, part of that comes from what we know from 
uh, the UN production gap report is telling us that we have no room in the carbon budget, if you will. We have no room to expand oil and gas infrastructure if we want to meet our international climate targets. And often the fossil fuel companies are the ones that are blocking that kind of policy level progress at an international and national scale. And pipelines are one of the things that mobilize folks as a line in the sand, in part because they can traverse thousands of area of miles of land and so they impact people all along that way all along the proposed routes that give people a voice in an otherwise you know place where they don't have a voice to speak up and i'll just you know i'll just say that this idea that demand is out there i think is very suspect at best we as you mentioned we have not seen a adequate demand that we need tar sands oil from the line 3 project and i think that often and we see the oil companies fabricating demand or even bolstering new markets for oil and gas as a way to justify continued profits from building pipelines and from extracting the oil. Daniel Rainey, one thing that seems to be a real game changer here is the move of the auto industry, which is basically the global auto industry said, we're not going to make any gasoline cars in what, 10 or 15 years. That's got to have a, you know, you did a report a few years ago, a couple years ago, looking at rising global energy demand over the next few decades. Most of the, the lines went up. Does the, the shift of the U.S. auto industry bend these curves and significantly affect the demand for oil that's going through these pipelines we're talking about? The short answer is yes. Uh, it makes a substantial difference. The electrification of the passenger vehicle fleet is going to dramatically reduce demand for uh, petroleum products, gasoline and diesel here in the United States. But it's also important to remember that as we electrify the passenger vehicle fleet, there's a whole lot of other vehicles that run on gasoline and diesel that are much harder to electrify. If we think about long haul trucking, if we think about aviation, if we think about long haul shipping, many of these things can be electrified to some degree, but some of the other ones we really don't have economic solutions for right now. And so uh, as we seek to electrify the uh, you know low hanging fruit, if you will, we also need to be investing in new technologies that can help us to decarbonize these harder to abate sectors, whether it's long distance tra transportation or manufacturing steel and cement uh, or other technologies where um, we know we need to get the emissions out of the system, but we don't quite know how we're going to do it yet. Right. And that's where perhaps hydrogen can come in and help with long haul trucks. Mike Fernandez. Yeah, and I think we have to continue to remember, too, what's the source of electricity. You know, if we look today at where the largest number of electric cars exist, they exist in China. And China's primary source for electricity is coal. That's not exactly where we want to end up. Similarly, what you also need to keep in mind is that Fossil fuels are used for many day-to-day uh, -day goods, including the headphones we're using for this interview, the computers that we're using in order to conduct this uh, discussion as well, as well as our own handsets that sort of guide our everyday life. And even those automobiles, the bodies of those automobiles are, are significantly made from products that originate from fossil fuels. Right. So there might be a future of oil companies as being plastics companies, which as far as the climate's concerned, if we don't burn it, that's good. The, Mike Fernandez, a small hedge fund gathered support from BlackRock and other huge investors to elect three insurgent members of the board of Exxon. That was a rare and stinging defeat for Exxon's leadership. What did you make of that moment? And could something like that happen at Enbridge or other energy companies where investors are saying protecting their financial investment and they don't see that they see a faster transition. No, I think that's right. I think what you're going to continue to see is more activism on the part of investors. I've worked for many different industries, and I've actually overseen the investor relations function for a lot of different companies. And what has been interesting is over the last decade, the increasing number of questions coming from analysts, first in Europe, but increasingly Europe, United States, Canada, and a few other places around how companies are responding to ESG, and in particular, the, the biggie in terms of the environment. 
Right. So we're going to see more pressure. You know, Enbridge has some wind, some some solar. What's the exit path when you Enbridge says, look, we're not going to do any more pipelines. We're going to only do wind. When are you going to walk away from from the dirty stuff? So p- part of part of what you have to do and, and, and demand isn't created. I mean, demand is something that is out there, despite what uh, Kelly suggested earlier. We wouldn't want infrastructure if there was no customer for it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to our investors. It doesn't make sense to our business people. But at the same time, there is an opportunity to rethink how the, these rights of way already exist. If you think about whole other industries in terms of like uh, the laying of fiber for telecommunications in the United States, most of that got laid alongside railway tracks. Uh, so where rights of way already exist for infrastructure, those same rights of way can be used to help the infrastructure associated with renewable energy. You're listening to a conversation about building new pipelines as the U.S. transitions away from oil and gas. Coming up... Burning fossil fuels in the United States was recently estimated to cause 300,000 excess deaths here in the U.S. And so we know that there are challenges of the transition, but we are almost certain across the economics and policy community that the damages from letting climate change continue at the pace that we are currently at is unacceptable. That's up next when Climate One continues. My guests today are Kelly Sheehan Martin of the Sierra Club, Daniel Ramey with Resources for the Future, and Mike Fernandez with the energy company Enbridge. We're talking about oil pipelines, why they are so contentious, and how they fit into a less carbon intensive future. The Atlantic Coast gas pipeline was canceled. The Keystone XL oil pipeline is dead after a decade-long battle. Penn East is another pipeline that seems to be on the ropes. I asked Daniel Ramey if the tide is turning against big new pipelines. I think they are facing increasing costs for many of the reasons that we've already talked about today. Uh, Part of that is the additional environmental reviews that are required when uh, folks from the environmental community are active against these projects. And so I think you can sort of chalk that up as a win for the environmental community uh, in being successful in slowing down some of these projects. At the same time, One of the concerns that uh, comes to my mind when we fail to build new infrastructure projects in the United States is that transitioning to a clean energy future is going to need lots and lots and lots of infrastructure. Building transmission lines across the United States is not an easy thing to do, but it is uh, absolutely an essential part of transitioning to a zero emissions future. The same thing is true for siting new wind and solar facilities. We're going to need to build these things at enormous scales, and we're going to need to do that despite the fact that there are tools in the regulatory uh, toolkit that those who are opposed to that infrastructure can use, whether it's to oppose an oil and gas pipeline or oppose a wind farm or an electricity transmission line. Kelly Sheehan Martin, there's a big infrastructure package, trillion dollars uh, coming through. It's not quite clear to me if it's actually been finalized yet. Um, Some environmentalists are disappointed with the climate components of that. How do you see the Biden infrastructure package with respect to climate? I am hopeful. I think there are uh, much needed investments in in clean energy infrastructure and in infrastructure that will make us more resilient to climate change that we will absolutely see in this package. And I think we'll also um, continue to see improvements uh, through the reconciliation process. And I'd like to see us remove fossil fuel subsidies as part of that as well, so that clean energy can compete on a level a level playing field. I just I just wanted to go back to something we were talking about a minute ago. I think this this argument that we hear all the time that is about, well, we use oil, we each use plastics, et cetera, is just such an unimaginative and old and outdated argument. Sure, yes, we are all part of the transition. And let's talk about what's next. Let's talk about how quickly we can transition off of fossil fuels instead of doubling down on this necessary evil argument that gets us nowhere. Mike Fernandez. 
Yeah, we're all keen for that transition. Um, at Enbridge, we committed to net zero by 2050, one of the first in, in the industry. You know, we're and then, not and all then keen two, to it if, we're also, of, buy, if yeah. we're also investing yeah. in new fossil fuel pipelines. We're Again, not. We're, and so and, this notion and we that we're are on track actually in terms of reducing yeah. carbon we're intensity by 30% in by 2030. It's nice to be talked over, nice to be engaged with political high hyperbole, but the facts are the facts. Well, uh, that net zero, and that's kind of the uh, you know coin of the realm these days. There's our companies to pledge net zero. Uh, a lot is in the details there, Mike Fernandez. Whether that includes offsets or you know there's there can be some sleight of hand there. Uh, and how is how is Enbridge going to be net zero? Are you going to rely on offsets that have a, a very questionable history? No, and, and part of it for us, as, as I uh, said earlier, is how we are going about managing our own operations, you know, so that much like we saw what happened when the Colonial Pipeline got hacked uh, back in, in May of this year, and it had uh, catastrophic circumstances, we know that electricity and digital plays a big role in managing these pipelines. Um, and so the electrical elements that we are using to manage that increasingly are being managed by renewables. Right, though the, the most of the impact is from consumer end users, you know, people who, I don't drive a gasoline car, but people who do, right? So it's not, you know, Enbridge's own corporate operations or a small piece of it. It's really the, the consumer burning that fuel. Mike Fernandez, oftentimes there's an argument that, you know, uh, changing will, will have costs. We got, we got to do this. But what's less often measured and discussed is the cost of inaction or the cost of slower action, right? The cost of heat domes in the Northwest that kill 600 more people than normally would have died and, and uh, the, the, the all sorts of costs. So I want to get you on that. You know, yeah, it's easy to talk about, oh, we can't do that because it'll cost X. Well, if we don't do it, it costs Y and Y is big and getting bigger. No, no, I, I think that's right. I think it, 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 from, a, from a broad analytical standpoint and, and even from a, a, a business and economic standpoint, um, there are costs always associated with uh, change. There are there are very few times where you can get good, fast, cheap, all in one. Um, oftentimes, you have to choose two. Um, and so, I think as 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 a business person, I I buy into that. The the question becomes: What are the level of the costs that are borne? Uh, by diverse communities, and and then you get into a whole discussion around, you know, equity as well as looking at uh, time to get to that amount of change that's necessary. You know, what you hope is that you can look at an array of changes over some period of time that allows you to diminish uh, the total of greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, there are simple so, let, things. Let me, jump, let me jump in here, Mike, and say, does that mean, for example, the Biden administration wants to look at overburdened communities and say, if there's a refinery and then a plastics factory, we don't want to put one more source of pollution. Do you support that kind of analysis that says, look, that, you know, these communities have been burdened. We shouldn't put one more source of pollution in them. Well, and, and I think you've got to look at each of those communities differently in the sense that sometimes the communities got built around them as opposed to the industrial elements uh, coming in after those communities were there, places that people didn't necessarily want to live, but they became the less expensive places to live because they were close to industrial communities. That's not right. We've got to find a way to deal with that. But where I was going with the analogy is on the other side is, is looking at the hopeful side to use uh, Kelly's line that, you know, if we were able to blend, you know, just 5% of hydrogen into natural gas, all of a sudden, that reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 2%. There are lots of those kinds of things that can be done with 
current infrastructure with current fossil fuel that can play into this overall equation if we will enable that to happen. Daniel Ramey. Just to this question of costs and benefits, I think we all know that there are costs to the energy transition. We all know that there are challenges and they're significant. But let's put them in perspective. If you look at the costs of inaction, they, by almost any accounting, far outweigh the costs of swift action. Uh, For example, a study in 2018 that was published in the journal Science estimated that each additional degree of Celsius uh, warming in the United States decreases U.S. GDP by 1.2%. Right? That's hundreds of billions of dollars per degree centigrade, and that's probably a lowball estimate. What's more, burning fossil fuels in the United States was recently estimated to cause 300,000 excess deaths here in the U.S. And so we know that there are challenges of the transition, but we are almost certain across the economics and policy community that the damages from letting climate change continue at the pace that we are currently at is unacceptable. Daniel Ramey, you've done research on orphaned oil and gas wells. We've been talking here about the need to, do we stop building new ones? What do we do with the existing and old ones? Whenever we do stop using oil pipelines, what happens to them and and who's responsible for cleaning up? I know that Enbridge has some of a plan for for decommissioning Line 3, but Daniel Ramey, what happens with this old dirty stuff as we get away from it? So I can't speak to pipelines. I haven't studied that, but I can speak to oil and gas wells. There are you know, roughly 2 million so-called abandoned wells in the United States. They're not being used for production or any other useful purpose. There are an estimated 1 million orphaned oil and gas wells. These are wells that are also not being used, and we don't know who owns them. Most of those million wells, we actually don't even know where they are. These wells risk uh, polluting groundwater resources. They risk air pollution. They emit methane, which, of course, exacerbates, ex- exacerbates the climate challenge. And they can cost 75 100 200 sometimes even a million dollars uh, to clean up. And so as we uh, think about moving away from fossil fuels, we also need to make sure that companies are solvent and that they are able to pay for the cost of decommissioning this infrastructure, whether it's an oil and gas well or a pipeline or a coal ash impoundment near a coal-fired power plant. And right now, the policies that are on the books are not sufficient uh, to uh, allow that to happen. Mike Fernandez, is Enbridge going to clean up its mess and pay for the pipelines that once they're... Um, yeah, there is a there is a process with pipelines, both in Canada and the United States, where companies go through and meet with their federal regulator in terms of how they actually clean the pipes and how they cap them. Um, there are uh, remaining issues as to whether or not you actually leave the pipe in the ground after it has been cleaned or you pull it out. And the the considerations there is that sometimes there can be environmental risk by how the pipeline is pulled out. As we get toward the end here, I want to think about what I've heard uh, from all of you is that uh, agree climate change is real. The transition needs to happen. Uh, there's some debate about how that happens and the speed of that happens. What else do you, the three of you, agree on, do you think, as we come to the end? So I agree with you. I, I, I agree. All of those things are true. The question is, I think, what amount of dislocation are we willing to tolerate as a society? Um, this isn't an easy jump cut, you know, to move from fossil fuels over to wind, solar, and other renewables. It really does require some level of transition and to be smart about it. Um, and that's what we want to do. We want to think anew. We want to have those conversations around how do we best get there. But you don't get there by certainly just shutting things off. Daniel Ramey, what do you think the three of you can agree on? We, there's a transition needs to happen. There's a disagreement on, on, on how and how fast. My hunch is that we would all agree on the notion that the energy transition needs to be equitable. We would probably disagree on some details about exactly what that means and how it gets done in the real world. But when I think about the energy transition and the need to dramatically reduce emissions, I think about uh, the 
risk to some low income consumers from higher energy prices. I think we would all agree that that's something to be avoided. I think we'd also agree that the workers and communities that today rely upon fossil fuels for jobs, for the tax base, for other economic benefits need to have a, 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 an equitable solution for them as well. Whether it's coal mining communities in Appalachia or oil producing regions of West Texas, I think there need to be investments made today so that communities can diversify their economies and succeed in a world where we are not using nearly as much uh, coal, oil, and gas. Kelly Sheehan Martin. I think we agree that there needs to be a transition off of fossil fuels. I would like to hope we do. I think that we agree that there needs to be a minimized level of disruption. I would hope that we agree that we need um, to be investing in the world we want to live in and stop pouring money and expenditures into things of the past. And I don't know that we agree about whose voices we listen to. And I don't know that we agree whether people who are most impacted by the climate crisis and whether clean water and clean air are more or less important than money. And that's what makes me sad. And that makes me worry and keeps me up at night that we might not be able to solve the climate crisis in the time that's needed. Kelly Sheehan Martin, the Senior Director of Energy Campaigns for the Sierra Club. Mike Fernandez, the Senior Vice President of Public Affairs, Communications, and Sustainability at Enbridge. And Daniel Ramey is a fellow at the Resources for the Future in Washington, D.C. Thank you all for coming on Climate One today. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Thanks so much. On this Climate One, we've been talking about the fight over pipelines and where they fit into an energy transition. To hear more Climate One conversations, subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be difficult and awkward, but it's critical to help advance awareness and understanding for positive change. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help open up the climate conversation. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Ariana Brocious is our producer and audio editor. Our audio engineer is Arnav Gupta. Our team also includes Steve Fox, Kelly Pennington, and Tyler Reed. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. Mm-hmm.